Hi, this is Stan Bush. Hi, this is Stephanie Calvert. This is John Payne. This is Jack Hughes. Hi, I'm Carrie Stevens. Hey, everybody, this is Prescott Niles. Hello, I'm Kofi Baker. But the Beatles were on another plane for me. Yeah, of course. Well, let's talk about one of those Beatles, because I imagine one of the highlights of your your SNL career must have been when Ringo uh, hosted Saturday Night Live. Yes. He the musical guest. He was the yes. host. Yes. And you're in a couple of sketches with him. Tell me what, whatever you remember about that whole experience about him coming in as the host. All right. Strap in. Are you yeah, ready? I'm locked in. Let's go. Ringo and Barbara went office to office. And my office is covered in Beatle posters. They come in and they sit down and you just put those up there for me, didn't you? And I go, no, Mr. Starkey, I, I didn't. I'm, I'm a huge Beatle fan. And he says, well, what do you want to know? And I go, well, um, what was it like when you were first on Ed Sullivan? Honestly, I asked him that question. Yeah. Well, you know, I remember the, you know, the curtain was there and we heard the girls screaming and then it opens up and it's all this craziness. And I couldn't tell, you know, where we were in the song. So I'd watch Paul and John and George's ass and watch the butts <laughs> to see where they were so I could keep time with it. But he said, it was just crazy. It was just crazy. So I'm thinking, oh my God, I've just gotten Ed Sullivan, that iconic performance from Ringo's perspective. Now, he then says, hang on. Do you have any place for me? Cigarette ashes. And I didn't smoke. So I said, here, take this coffee cup. Oh. And he used it for his cigarette ashes, which I have to this day are Ringo's cigarette ashes. Wow. Oh, there's more. Okay. So, then, <laughs> so then he says, well, do you have any ideas for the show? And I go, well, Mr. Starkey, you know, I'd love to do a thing on a hard day's night where we suddenly, where you leave because somebody in, hurt your feelings and you leave Rockefeller Center and we can't find you. And then we kick up, dun, 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 dun. We kick up this boy music and you're just walking through New York. You befriend a, you know, a small lad and it's just like a hard day's night and you're arrested and we have to go find you. And that's how the show will start. It was a beautiful idea because it would have been funny, but it was it would have been such a a respectful um, such a respectful way to introduce Ringo and call back to his debut in a hard day's night. And he's all he says, no, I don't want to do any Beatles stuff. No. And so boo just deflated the whole idea. Sure. He ended up doing a Beatle thing, which I was part of, but I didn't like. And it was a, a Beatles auction. And the actual Ringo Starr comes out in his Beatle suit, and nobody's particularly interested. And I bid more money, I think, on Paul McCartney's toothbrush. Yes, yes sir, 65000 Oh, uh, no. Uh, I was wondering about the jacket he's wearing. Yes. Was it by any chance ever worn by Paul? Uh, no, it wasn't. I'm sorry. No. And he got laughs, but I always thought that's wrong. Yeah. That's not the way to respect him. Oh, but there's more. We're standing backstage waiting to go on for the sketch, onto the live show. And I'm, it's me and Ringo. Me oh. and Ringo. And I don't know how it came up, but he said, you know, my son Zach is a drummer. And I go, yes, I, I know pretty much. I know when Zach was born, Mr. Starkey. Uh, I know all about, please don't be frightened, but I know all right. about your life. And he goes, he's a drummer. And one day he can, comes up to me and he says, hey, dad, can you do this? And he plays something real fancy with the hi hat and the, the t floor tom and all of this in funky syncopation. He's just all over the place, right? And I said, no, son, I can't, but can you do this? And he beats out a time signature with this hand and a different time signature with the other hand simultaneously. Oh, wow. And I thought to myself, that's why you were the drummer for the Beatles. Yes. Because you could instinctively feel the time signature, where it had to go, when it changed. You only played enough to service the song. That's why you were the drummer for the Beatles. Yeah. You know, it's funny that 
I, I just watched a video where they were they were talking about how Ringo has his whole career. You know, he, he it's sort of like that Joe Piscopo thing you're talking about, where if if you're talking about the Beatles, you know, it's like oh, and Ringo too, I guess. But I think part of that was because he was, he seemed to be an awfully good sport about that kind of thing when he could have gotten he frankly offended. I I watched the uh, the the auction sketch, and he seemed to to play along and, and not be too upset by the premise at all. He, he, he loved it. Yeah. He loved it. I thought it was contrary to what he had told me, sure. which was so, but maybe he just didn't want to be so bow down beetle, you oh. know, godlike, like I am. And he wanted to just put a pin in it. And yeah. obviously that's what he did. He put a pin in it and it was funny, but yeah. yeah, but he was the drummer for the Beatles. You know, he never pretended to be a songwriter. You know, he called the other three guys the writers. Oh. <laughs> that was his name for his three friends, the writers. You know, yeah. they would come in with stuff. And, and he, he, he did his part perfectly.